have been brought to sort this of... This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. That's, I should say that too. This meeting is being recorded, just so you know. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience in the last nine months to be between uh, two places uh, on the same campus because I get to see uh, how engineers think and how people in the field of uh, science and technology studies feel, feel and, and interact with their world. And they are two distinct life worlds for the greater part, although there are academics that are oscillating between the two. And these are the people who I think can see the importance of working together. And a, a, a topic such as the one that I posed today that has been lingering in the media itself now for at least five years is social media and artificial intelligence uh, within a national security context. And I set the scene here from the perspective that while we have been using social media initially in a novel way to communicate in very short micro blog formats uh, to introduce to one another various uh, streams of multimedia, we have decided to use social media in a different way uh, in the last number of years, harnessing its power to look at things like sentiment analysis and perhaps to manipulate that sentiment in some way through micro-targeting. Uh, I started in the, this sort of area by looking at two warring factions, uh, the Israeli Defense Force and also the al Qassam Brigade uh, quite a few years ago now. And I was looking at how social media and even smartphones at the time were being used to micro-target messages to soldiers one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if you do not do this, I will do this. I will unleash X, Y, and Z. And uh, cleverly, one of the conversation editors who helped me with the piece uh, described this as conflict 2.0. This was the beginning. You know how we used to talk about social media as the 2.0 of the web, but well, they described it as a conflict 2.0. And I started to think about this deeply, especially as our technologies, which are Wi-Fi enabled and Internet of Things enabled now, uh, may begin to see with their eyes and hear with their ears and transcribe and report back almost this constant feedback loop. So imagine uh, these microphones being linked to something like Dragon Software that is capturing everything I'm saying now word for word. And that's often how I write my articles. I talk into a microphone and that microphone actually um, provides an outlet transcribing what I say so that I'm not sitting there typing all the time. It just depends how I'm feeling. So imagine everything here that was internet enabled was capturing various things, movement, words, views, who are you? And without asking you and without requiring name tags, I would know. And what would happen, I could give you a full transcription of this meeting. I could, I could, I could record not only Braden's face, but Braden's speech and your responses and look at whether you're male or female and look at your demographic data, uh, your ethnicity, uh, your affiliation, or at least the affiliation you wrote down uh, on the piece of paper. <laughs> and the system would be able to tell me whether that was true or false based on certain demographic data. Um, but what happens when we take that context and we move it outside to the streetscape? and our lampposts become alive. They are not only CCTV recorders, but they are listening. They're listening for a pulse. And that pulse changes. So maybe every day has a certain frequency and the amplitude changes over time because something happens in the street and I anticipate what will happen. But what happens when I can not only anticipate what will happen, but control what will happen? Like those people in those, uh, sort of a television series so they could control the weather. And can we control the weather? We can control the people. We can settle them down if they're anxious. Can we control the people when they're anxious? And how what, may we be able to do that with feedback loops? Is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it a good thing to say, well, we all want peace. How can we institute algorithms to create peace? And in the same way, 
how can we institute algorithms to create habit? And who are you? What actor are you? Which one? Why? What are your motivations? And how do we ensure this power balance remains in check? when it's not just the government or government agencies or law enforcement or national security uh, enforcement like defense uh, personnel have access to this capability. And I always point back to the asymmetry uh, and the unconventional attacks that we see uh, causing so much havoc uh, through non-state actors who are simply adopting state or methods. So if I unleash, then I should expect to cop the same back. And then what? And then what? Oh, and then we go to 3.0 and 4.0, and they tell us 5.0 is coming within nine months. And what's 5.0 going to do? Faster, bigger, more. And our time spans and our ability to condense information will get smaller and smaller and smaller from what used to be 13 seconds on the web to perhaps eight seconds today before my attention goes to perhaps maybe four in 10 years time. What does it do to us? What then? What's the next step? What's the next counter attack? What's, what are we doing here? Where are we going? And so <coughs> with that very brief uh, introduction to motivate you to understand why I wanted to host this right now, apart from the joy of being in DC for tomorrow's AAS, AAAS uh, forum uh, is to say to you, we have, I would say, and it's, it's arguable, but I would say Braden Allenby is probably the world's foremost uh, knowledgeable expert uh, coming to us live from uh, Tempe, Arizona, uh, on this topic. So, Braden, uh, thank you very much. I, I'd like you to introduce yourself uh, in, in whatever way you want, uh, but I appreciate that you got up so early in the morning uh, to do this presentation for us. Over to you. Well, so I would say that I'm in front of you, but whether I'm up or not is probably an arguable <laughs> question. Uh, thank you, Kat. Um, and and thank, you for, uh, thank you for the uh, effusive introduction. Uh, it, when you're talking about this kind of thing, it's often useful to know a little bit about the, the context that the individual comes from. Uh, among my formative experiences uh, uh, was working in the government as a, an attorney, uh, working for AT&T as senior environmental attorney, uh, and as the vice president for environmental health and safety with responsibility for those activities around the world. And also uh, a year I took off to work down at the National Academy of Engineering on engineering and environmental issues. Uh, and two years that I worked at Lawrence Livermore National Labs uh, as the associate director of uh, energy and environmental systems. So I have a varied background. Uh, I tend to come more from the operational side than I do from the theoretical and academic side. So that's me uh, for, what it's, uh, for what it's worth. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a, an extended scenario with you, which uh, to Kat's points, uh, demonstrates that we're actually further down the runway than we think and given that that's what we know in public from published sources uh, I don't work on the on the classified side of these issues because then you can't talk about them as freely um, I think that the the questions are well put and I think that the challenges are actually far more significant than we realize uh, particularly when we begin looking at the social implications. Now the question of how we might intervene, I'll touch on at the end, but I think it's important to note right up front that we really don't know how to intervene effectively in complex adaptive systems. If we did know that, uh, AT&T wouldn't have had a near-death experience and gotten picked up by SBC. Uh, we had Bell Labs, we had very good managers, et cetera, et cetera, and we still got blindsided. 
which I think is an important object lesson and something that's worth remembering uh, as we think about what we can and can't do in, uh, in these very tumultuous times. So with that, let's go on. Uh, I'm not predicting, it's an extended scenario. I also want to point out that the fact that I bring issues to your attention does not mean that I like them. The fact that I argue that they might be real does not mean I think they're a good thing. Um, uh, both me and my mother disavow uh, any identification with what I'm going to say in the next hour. All right, so what are some of the things going on? I mean, try to put this in, in the context of everything rapidly changing, and that's part of the challenge, of course. So what we have is we have advances in a number of fundamental areas, behavioral economics, with all the work that's been done on slow and fast thinking, um, system two thinking versus system one thinking, uh, and learning how people can be driven into decision-making modes that are based on heuristics and emotion, not on rational analysis. Evolutionary psychology. Our psychology was developed in, um, in Africa on the plains, on the savanna. It's not a surprise that it, uh, it may show leaks when you put it into the 21st century. What's pretty amazing is how adaptive that psychology has turned out to be. Neurosciences and, and advances in cognitive science. Uh, it's fascinating that when you go to uh, neuroscientific conferences now, you have the neuroscientists with things they're doing that are uh, absolutely amazing. And then on the other side of the aisle, you have the political operatives and you have the uh, marketing operatives. And you know that they're also uh, intelligence and security folks in that audience. This kind of, this kind of overlap is extraordinarily challenging. Uh, but the important thing to think about is when people talk about what's changed today, one of the things that's changed is we've learned a lot more about human cognition and how to manipulate it. That's one way that what happens today differs from, say, disinformation during the Cold War. Advances in social media. Um, when did Facebook become the, um, the determiner of whether or not you had free speech? Oh, legally you may have free speech, but if you can't get on Facebook, then you're a voice crying in the wilderness. You really have no free speech. Uh, AI, big data analytics, the power of AI, I think is just beginning to be realized. Now underneath that is the same kind of advanced neural net technology that, that DeepMind, for example, uses. But the application process is proving to be uh, radical, even revolutionary. Um, computational power, when you platform this on computational power and on the amount of data you can collect on populations, you begin to create the opportunity for real breakthroughs in AI interaction with humans at the individual, the micro, and the population level. Radical complexity. We underestimate this. We talk about this all the time. Oh, it's really a complex world out there. And indeed, it is. But Radical complexity drives many people back to their foundational narratives. If you're overloaded by the amount of information that you're expected to manage and by the implications of that information, right? The Internet of Things extended to smart city, then you tend to fall back into more foundational narratives. It's a very, very common defense mechanism and it's one that we see um, around the world. It's not just the amount of information that's changed. It's the velocity. It's the variety. And also, and this is important to always remember, um, it's the fact that the information that we are being exposed to is not raw. It's not just out there because somebody clicked. It's out there because there are a lot of people, from marketing to, to geopolitics, who are using what we've learned in behavioral economics to drive your behavior in ways that you don't realize, you don't understand, and you may not even perceive. The geopolitics uh, have shifted fundamentally. And again, this, this goes towards part of the new environment. Western universalism 
uh, since the, the founding of the UN, the end of World War II, we've essentially been able to assume that Western universalism defines the, the ethical framework for the world. That was the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, that's no longer the case. And the, the, the uh, increasing contingency of Western universalism is something that has not been accepted by the US, by Americans, by American institutions, or by American NGOs, uh, nor by the Europeans for that matter. So we end up in a conflict about fundamental values uh, that, that is uh, invisible but extremely powerful and has significant implications for how information uh, social media are used. The Westphalian world order is failing. Uh, in, in this week's Economist, there's a discussion about how um, royalty is coming back, uh, which is interesting but, but not totally relevant, except it points out that there are places in the world, such as, for example, the Middle East, uh, where royalty never went away. So our assumption of the state-based Westphalian world order, which again is very much embedded in American policy, in American attitudes, uh, both in, in firms, NGOs, and in the government, that also is going to create enormous structural change and opportunities for conflict. Uh, this is made more obvious by the whole of society uh, uh, doctrines and strategies that the, in particular, the Russians and the Chinese have adopted. It's one thing to say that, well, we may fight um, a, a counterinsurgency or an insurgency operation. It's another thing to say that what we're looking at is conflict across the entire frontier of a civilization. I may go after your leaders, I may impugn them in the press, that's part of the conflict. I may go after your financial system. I may go after, um, I may go after dissatisfaction in, in tribes that I have helped create or exacerbate. That whole panoply of, of frontier of attack means that a traditional structure such as the United States where we have the military separate from uh, civilian uh, operations and we have the public separate from private firms. Uh, Google can tell the US government it doesn't want to cooperate. That structure makes the United States and countries like it much more vulnerable to a whole of society attack, particularly if the attack is carried out over a long period of time. One of the things that, that is, I think, interesting is I ask my classes routinely, uh, what kinds of conflicts do you see that, that are difficult? And they come up with the obvious ones that everybody would pick out. Iran, North Korea, we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq. What they never do come up with is the fact that the Russians and the Chinese are in the process of whittling away at the American uh, civilization, the American culture across a very broad frontier. It isn't just tanks. In fact, as the Russians would tell you, if you have to use tanks, you fail. Look at their attack in Ukraine. It was, from an operational perspective, it was a brilliant invasion. Uh, it continually stayed below the level of conventional force that might have engaged NATO in a discussion of response. Uh, brilliantly done. Now, whether strategically in the long term it was a good move is a different question. Operationally, it was brilliant. By the way, I plan to talk for about um, uh, 40 minutes plus or minus and then open it up for questions. And if you have questions during this, uh, I'm not quite sure how that works on Zoom, but wave your hands and somebody will somebody will stop me. Thanks, Brayden. Not a problem, Kat. So the, the patterns that we're seeing arise include things like the neo-medievalism or durable disorder that you find in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, where you don't and you never will go back to a state-based system because you never really had one in those areas. Instead, you go to a very dynamic pattern of conflicting uh, power centers, but no single center is able to establish absolute authority. The implications of that are both that you continue to have a very, very complex political environment, 
because of the shifting power structures. Uh, but also, the level of violence in those areas goes up significantly compared to a state. Leviathan, as it turns out, was probably right. You may be in a bad state, a bad Leviathan, but it's a lot better than being in Syria. So, so the idea of durable disorder, the weakening of the state in particular areas and not in others, these are the kinds of, of new and chaotic situations that make the strategic um, uh, and the doctrinal environment so challenging and complex. We also, uh, whether or not we like it, have gotten into a postmodern and post-factual culture. That was very clear. It's clear every day on the front page of the Washington Post. What that does is that feeds a world where multiple competing narratives at all scales is not the exception, it's the norm. And it means that the um, strategies that people use to reduce the impact of the information flow on themselves involves falling back into more foundational narratives, which in turn become the structure around which you build tribes. And if you're smart, like the Russians, you're able to take those, those uh, ring fence communities and you're able to turn them into bastions of truth in seas of ignorance and worse yet, immorality um, and those who would tear down everything that you hold dear. So you get increasing fundamentalism. And remember that we're learning uh, continually how to be far more effective in enhancing fundamentalism by enhancing the emotional and the narrative response over the rational response. One of the things behavioral economics tells us very clearly is that trying to respond rationally is a very limited capability. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of time, and our decision-making has evolved so that we don't have to do it unless we absolutely are pushed into it. So we keep reverting back to the simpler heuristic-based, emotional-based uh, decision process, which drives us back to narrative. Uh, we're seeing widespread institutional failure. Uh, I think the institutional failure is different than we usually think about in the United States. Uh, you tend to run into people that either say everything's failing or don't worry, everything's really secure at the core and this is just a passing fantasy. I think both of those are wrong. I think there are some fundamental failures in the Western governance model. The Enlightenment, much to our chagrin maybe, actually worked. And what it has done in the process of creating a world of unimaginable wealth, of population, of many, many people growing out of poverty into the middle class, what it has done is it has also obsoleted itself. And that poses particular challenges to those countries like Canada, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, that were founded on in, um, uh, enlightenment principles rather than blood and soil. Very hard for uh, anybody but Native Americans in the U.S. to claim blood and soil because at best it goes back, what, until 1650, 1700. Uh, that's not the case in, say, the, the Celtic uh, United Kingdom. It's not the case in Germany, in Russia, or in China, but it is the case in the United States. As an enlightenment structure, we are much more at risk if the Enlightenment has, in some important ways, become obsolete. So that raises, I think, the interesting question, which uh, many people uh, uh, are not willing to try to grapple with, which is, uh, for 250 years, pluralism has proven itself to be a very effective and powerful governance mechanism. Is it still ascendant? given AI, given social credit systems, given the challenges of the present um, as soft authoritarianism. And I think one can argue that soft authoritarianism properly done may, because of technology, be becoming a more powerful and more fit uh, form of governance. Remember, I didn't say I agreed with everything that I was going to say. No. I want to take a quick look at uh, how AI-powered tribalism works. Uh, 
there are two points here. One is, I'm going to go over this really fast. If you want to look at some of the details of the cultural and psychological uh, categories, they're in the slides for you, but, but I'm going to ignore them in the interest of time. Secondly, I think it's important to understand that identity and narrative are battle spaces. These are not neutral grounds where things are just confusing. These are active grounds of contention for purposes of geopolitics, ideology, or theology. And we ignore that at our peril. So these are, most of you probably recognize these, some of the memes that went out in 2016. Um, on the left, you have one that went out to a limited number of uh, American service people who were serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it's essentially Satan, if I win, Clinton wins, Jesus, not if I can help it, press like to help Jesus win. Um, this went out to an identified micro audience. Indications are that it was very effective. Uh, the, the one on the right looks like something that many other people would agree with. Um, you know, water, not oil. This was about the, uh, the Dakota pipeline, and it was very effective with its target group. Point being that we tend to have an assumption, particularly in the United States, that if we're morally right, things are gonna work out. That is not an operative assumption if what you're talking about is the kind of conflict environment that we're in today. The, the tools, these are very primitive. I mean, the Russians approach this in a very intelligent way. They didn't try to develop a theory. They didn't try to think about, well, what would postmodernism say about the use of this image? No, they just threw stuff against a wall. They watched what happened. They would sometimes do thousands of A-B tests a day over the internet, um, over social media, and then they would target particular groups of voters. Uh, state of the art now is you can get down to maybe five or 10, uh, and we're not at all far from targeting individuals based on their psychological profile. So identity, I'm not going to uh, talk about it. It's all in here. What I want to do is I want to focus on uh, this. What I've done is begin to create a very simple model. This is more a schematic to give you an idea of how it would work. We've identified a number of cultural values which differ across cultures in identifiable ways. Now, obviously, there's a huge overlap between some of these. These are not orthogonal. That is, they are interdependent variables. The same is true with the psychological traits. Um, the big five are the ones that I've listed. There are many, many others that could be listed. This matrix, if you began to do it operationally, would rapidly grow into n dimensions. Um, and you have trouble presenting it as a matrix. That simplifies the math, but that's not the way that these things operate in the real world. So think of beginning to look at massive amounts of information, say from the social credit system in China, using cultural values and psychological traits to begin to create a, um, a psychological uh, volume, an n-dimensional psychological volume. Now, these are all the cultural values. As I say, I'm not gonna go through these. Psychological traits, here are more psychological traits. Uh, here's uh, the beginning of work, this comes out of uh, Finland. Um, this is some beginning work tying in different aspects of human behavior, uh, thinking, and so forth. So think of that matrix as being integrated into something like this. And of course, what you realize is very soon, um, our capability to think about that fails. These are very complex. They're interrelated. Uh, the data are very complex. So the ability of a human to think about this is um, simply non-existent. It's too complex. But you can do it with an AI, which is very good at looking at extraordinarily complex data and beginning to develop its own models. Uh, this is, in fact, what, what Google did. It's similar to what Google did when it did AlphaGo Zero, which rapidly became um, the dominant Go power on the entire planet. So what you do is you create a unique hypervolume for each individual. You have an n-dimensional model uh, that the AI builds of an individual's behavior. And then you look to see what unique subshapes would give you the ability to exploit 
um, uh, to, to model behavior so that they would behave in ways that you want. Now, you're not going to be able to take, say, um, a Hillary Clinton voter and turn him or her into a rabid Trump person, at least not in the short term. That's, that's not what this technology does. What it does do is it means I can learn to manipulate you in ways that you won't recognize, and you won't be aware of, that, are, that, are, uh, that fit with your narrative because I have been able to help shape your narrative over time. Two points about this. One is, this is not new. This is called reflexive control, and it's something that the Soviets tried to do uh, during the Cold War, but the technology wasn't there and they didn't have the data. The second thing is, we can already see this at play. If you remember Charlottesville, you remember that the um, white supremacists were chanting, Russia is our friend. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of strange because they like to position themselves as hyper-patriots. But if you realize that Russia had been working for years with the alt-right in Europe and through the alt-right in Europe, working into the alt-right in the United States, then what you realize is they've achieved reflexive control. They don't have to tell those white supremacists to chant that. They chant it because they think they thought of it and it's what they mean. So this is already happening in, say, pilot scale, if you will. What we're doing is we're simply applying AI to make it much more effective. What do you need to do that? Well, the critical thing is you need a relatively competent state scale AI. Well, there's a number of countries that are working on that and a number of companies that probably already have it. And you need massive amounts of data on people. You get that in China, for example, through the social credit system. One aspect of that system, which is widely misunderstood in Western cultures, is the fact that it produces an enormous amount of personal data that can be tracked back and validated. So you're constantly developing models of individuals. Then you're going out, are they really behaving like my model says? Then you're bringing that data back and reevaluating. So it is a huge benefit to have that kind of database. Data are critical. So anything that impedes data collection, such as the European General Data Protection Regulation, in essence, strongly favors China and Russia over the West. Now, if you talk to people who work on that, they'll say, absolutely not. Privacy is a transcendental value. It's a human right. Um, so it doesn't really, that doesn't come into play. I think for the most part, people don't realize how uh, substantially beneficial something like a reduced interest in privacy in China is to the development of the technologies that are going to be increasingly important in global geopolitical conflict. So, a couple of um, observations. First, the Enlightenment values that have underpinned the American experiment for 200 years are failing, meaning most of our institutions are uh, at risk, uh, particularly because of the changed information environment. Very simply, what on earth led us to believe that we could take information, and after all, humans and their institutions and their cultures are in some ways simply information processing mechanisms, that we could so profoundly change the information environment and it wouldn't have any effect on our governance, on our institutions, on our psychology. I think what we're seeing is simply the fact that we failed to truly understand what the shifts in information technology uh, taken across the board were going to do. So, um, don't have to talk about that. So a couple of things uh, that, that demonstrate where I think uh, we're at risk and we don't realize it and we don't really think about why. So first, as you know, the American Constitution embeds a split between the military and civilian spheres, and it makes the civilian sphere uh, dominant over the military sphere. In a lot of ways, this has served the United States very well. Uh, we've avoided coups. We've avoided military governments. Um, we've been able to uh, grow a civilian society that prospered along with a strong military. Uh, now, however, 
what that split is doing is making it almost impossible for the United States to mount a whole of society defense against whole of society conflicts. Uh, it, it, for example, um, <laughs> the attack on, on Sony, uh, the stealing of all of that data from, from OPM on, on millions of people with, with security clearances. Um, I'm told, I'm told by some people that, that the Chinese now know more about me than the Americans because the Chinese are actually looking at the data and the Americans aren't. Well, that's, I know somebody files for my tax returns. Um, so, so this creates a significant structural disadvantage. Another structural disadvantage, which is similar, but equally potent is the fact that, uh, in, uh, Enlightenment societies, we tend to separate private from public operations. Now, I know all about lobbying and all the rest of it. These are very general principles, but they're principles that are baked into the model of governance that we operate under today. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that uh, our adversaries, state-based adversaries such as China, are able to integrate with their uh, private firms, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, in ways that the Americans can't. In fact, as we all know, uh, Google uh, employees refuse to cooperate with the U.S. government and the U.S. military, um, while at the same time they're working with China in ways which tend to tick off the U.S. military. Uh, who's right on that uh, depends entirely on where you sit. But notice that our model involves the state relying on private firms for at least some of the capability to respond to challenges. And as the private firms uh, become international, become truly global, they're no longer American companies. They can't simply say, yes, sir, we sign up. Facebook, for example, think about Facebook trying to manage uh, speech. If they take off too much in the United States, the, um, the, um, uh, the right complains that they're being denied freedom of speech. Uh, if they don't take it off, uh, the left complains that they're sponsoring hate speech. There's no good solution for that even in the United States. Now you take, uh, you take uh, Facebook Global, and the problem is they're trying to figure out how to manage speech for people all around the world with very different ideas of what's appropriate for freedom of speech. The Chinese, for example, quite legitimately under the Confucian system, tend to value social stability very highly, even over some things that the Americans might call freedom of speech. It's not that anybody's right or wrong uh, when you look at it from that perspective. It's that it's a huge intractable mess because everybody's going to Facebook and saying, whatever you're doing, you're denying freedom of speech, you're not protecting freedom of speech. Facebook's response can't be, Whoa, we serve the globe and you're not the globe anymore because the Americans aren't ready to hear that. So Facebook is really stuck in a terribly difficult position. Um, I know it's very unpopular, but I kind of, uh, I kind of feel sorry for Facebook. I think that they, they saw that they were setting up something that they thought would be cool uh, everybody can talk to everybody else, how wonderful, uh, and we can make a lot of money while they do that. Well, that's cool. Uh, and suddenly, they're in charge of free speech for the world. They didn't ask for that. I mean, what do you do? You go into an electrical engineer and say, solve free speech? I don't think so. So, so the problem is not that Facebook is evil, which is something apparently a lot of people are, are moving towards. The problem is that the structures that we're used to living under have fragmented responsibility in ways that when they mesh with the geopolitical structure, with the increasing power of firms, simply break down. And our ability to manage based on our past experience begins to fail. Identity. Think about what identity means. Think about what it means to say that I have weaponized narrative, that I can now go in and particularly with advanced CGI and voice, I can make you think what I want you to think so that you'll behave in the way I want you to behave. Reflexive control. Uh, 
Can I do that? Well, Cambridge Analytica claimed they did in the last election. There's been a lot of plus and minus, pro and con on that. Um, I think the jury's still out on Cambridge Analytica. What is clear is that given the resources of a nation state and the advances that have been made since 2016, that is a very, very compelling probability. Um, and so what you have is not citizens rationally thinking about policy. What you have is tribes that are being steered by narratives that can be manipulated without people understanding they've been manipulated into certain kinds of political behavior. What that means is that the individual is no longer an appropriate functional unit of society. The citizen as the core of governance is an obsolete concept. So what we have now is we have very powerful tribal entities that define themselves by a core narrative that is, at least in part, being structured by, in, a, in a very conflictual process between adversaries and is also being strengthened because it views anything outside the narrative as being the other, as being not just somebody who doesn't agree with you, but in fact, as being somebody who is inimical to your interests, possibly even inimical to your culture, your society, your country. Democracy as we know it is obsolete. Fine, what, other, what else can we say? Well, let's turn to checks and balances. Uh, checks and balances, again, an extraordinary uh, 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 structure of genius when we developed it uh, as America was being founded as an enlightenment society. Today, what does it do? Well, it has two failures. The first failure is, of course, and we all know this, and you can look in Fukuyama and other political uh, scientists and, and see this fairly clearly. The first is that when you drive a checks and balances system into a tribal political culture, you end up with stasis. Now, you want a certain amount of stasis um, because otherwise you have chaos, otherwise you're Somalia. Uh, but you don't want the kind of stasis that we're seeing in most advanced countries now where you have absolutely no movement, even on things where people agree. Uh, and that's where we are today, of course. And part of that is because we structured representative democracy based on an assumption about individuals. And now we have a tribal structure and the tribal structure changes the dynamics of how a representative democracy has to work. The second issue is that a checks and balances system by definition takes time because you're you're constantly checking and balancing in a lot of ways a checks and balances system is similar to uh system two in behavioral economics the rational system you think about it you play off plus and minus what's good what's bad where we are today though is that checks and balances system uh is holding us back because we can't move fast enough. We're still talking about weaponized narrative at five years after, or uh, four years, three years, after 2016, when it was very clear what had happened. Why? Because we can't react rapidly. The Russians, on the other hand, are getting very good at this kind of postmodern circus. And that leaves us at a very competitive disadvantage. Freedom of speech has been weaponized. I mentioned that. Think about it this way. If Russia comes in with those advertisements and deliberately tries to change American voting in an election, that's against the law. But if Russia can get American alt-right and alt-left to, uh, to spread the memes for them, that becomes protected political speech. If I send out the same meme that maybe a Russian sent me, that's protected political speech. The original act may have been criminal, but I'm just expressing my views. So, criminalized First Amendment. Political speech has been outsourced to private firms. Uh, the idea of privacy is now best defended by Apple telling Facebook it's got to do certain things or it'll get kicked off. So what we have is privacy by app, which is not what perhaps the founding fathers were thinking of. We haven't begun to adjust at all to the fact that the Westphalian world order and Western universalism is no longer universal or a world order. 
uh, our ability to operate in a much more complex, very morally gray world um, uh, is, is increasingly non-existent in part because our behavior becomes more tribal as a country. Science and observation are failing as sources of truth. Uh, that was early enlightenment, right? Science and observation were supposed to replace simply relying on authority, Aristotle or the church fathers. Uh, but what we've got now is a situation, and recent polls uh, show that it's, uh, this trend is accelerating, where people simply cherry pick science to support their position. So science has become just another normative dialogue that is a power play if you want to make certain points. So the anti-vaxxers, the anti-GMOs, the anti-evolution, the anti-climate change, all of this represents a breakdown in the idea of a socially uh, wide truth that is able to support social initiatives across an entire culture and moving much more into a tribal truth where truth becomes simply another way of attacking the other, which is everybody who's not in your tribe. All right, now uh, we've talked about that, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so what can we do? Let's, let's close on a uh, slightly more optimistic note. Uh, well, I think one thing we can do is we can try to think about, as we go into a period of change, what we can save and what we can't save. What can we keep? What we, do we have to jettison? What do we need to modify? The right to privacy. Um, I think most people working in technology would tell you that privacy has been obsolete for years. There's no such thing. And the efforts to pretend that you have it are even more dangerous than recognizing that you don't have it because it gives you the illusion of privacy. So it becomes a way to manage the public as opposed to actual privacy. Um, the way to think about this, though, is not at all clear, right? I mean, I've made some suggestions, but, but if checks and balances doesn't work, the immediate response, at least my immediate response, would be, all right, Brad, you're such a smart kid. What would you put in its place? My answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> and I think what that means is we need to have a, a dialogue, not unlike the Federalist Papers, but including all of the different ways that we, that we structure our information now, that is, that particularly understands that, in fact, uh, our current structure is failing. Uh, the assumption of the dialogue would be, it's 1788, what are you gonna want in 1790? And I think, 1778. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a very legitimate question. Um, if, if we're looking at 1789, the French Revolution, remember that after the revolution, after Napoleon, you still had France. It was a different France. It had different values, but you still had France. So the question would not be, oh my goodness, everything's going to crash. The question would be, how do you, how do you move from the Ancien Regime to post-Napoleonic France and preserve the values that you can, the good that you can, from the last 250 years? And I think creating a curated new federalist project and a series of workshops and conferences that would look at aspects of that would be a good way to start. Very important. One of the critical elements of American uh, response to whole of civilization conflict, whole of society conflict, is American soft power. American and European soft power are very, very potent. That's in part why Russia, Mr. Putin, chose to attack particularly that aspect. That's one reason why, for example, some of the actions of American politics in Washington today are so destructive. It isn't just that they're stupid, it's that they're undermining American soft power, which is probably our best way to manage a long-term civilizational conflict. We also need to take into account the fact that our idea about the state is, um, uh, is archaic. The, the real heirs to the Enlightenment might, and well, might well be the companies that we have created, Google, Facebook, rather than the Westphalian state. By uh, exploring that 
does not mean that you agree with it or disagree with it, but it does mean that you're trying to grapple with a reality that to date has been so significant um, that we've, I think, not understood it very well at all. When most of your operating assumptions, including the implicit ones, become contingent, then one of your difficulties is you keep trying to make some principles um, uh, absolute so that you can rely on them. But we can't do that anymore. Radical subsidiarity. I don't know how you get around this. We keep wanting to build a series of rights that are going to be applied to everybody at the same time that the Western universalist concept and framework that is supposed to is supposed to protect these and promulgate them around the world is failing. So there's some disconnects between uh, our hopes, our desires, and what's actually happening out there on, on the street. I think one of the things we're gonna to have to learn is that there may be things that we can only do within the United States. We may, for example, want to continue to privilege freedom of speech to the extent we can. That doesn't mean we're going to be able to get Facebook to do that around the world. That's just not going to work. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Uh, you did a great job. I know it's difficult to present remotely, but I know we're going to have lots of questions. Very engaging uh, from the Thank audience. You. You can just speak up and you're, you're, you're being heard. Hi, I'm Shannon Abate from Virginia Tech. Um, thanks, that was very provocative on a number of levels. Um, I have to question whether a race to the bottom with China in terms of privacy protection is our only hope. Um, why not focus on better defenses like teaching Americans not to get their news to social media, which is insane. Um, encouraging internet business models that are based on users paying for services rather than non-transparent transparent surveillance and monetizing. Uh, in other words, let's not take the current technological order as fixed and untouchable and only the politics can change. Uh, why not mobilize engineers and policymakers to create a new social media platform that's not as susceptible to AI-based manipulation, uh, perhaps in part because it would have robust policy protection. So I'm, I'm wondering about kind of different ways. Well, so let me begin by saying I think we ought to explore everything. As I say, what I presented to you, albeit I tried to present it forcefully, is a scenario. And we don't know at this point uh, what we're actually going to see. It's still 1788, right? They haven't taken the Bastille yet. Um, the the concern I have with privacy is that it, is, it has been turned into a transcendental value just at the time when all indications are it no longer exists. Um, and I think, I think that the danger from privacy is not that we can't try to maintain it. I think that it's as long as we look at privacy as a, an absolute right, uh, and you didn't say that, I'm extemporizing. Um, I think that we fail to understand that there may be other ways to achieve the ends that we seek. So for example, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, the saying was, city air makes you free. Um, God knows it had to do something because all the data indicate that if you went to a city, you died younger. Um, and you were probably less healthy, but it made you free. Now, they didn't mean you had privacy. What they meant was you had anonymity, and, and you could walk the streets of a medieval town or city, and you would be anonymous but not private. Uh, similarly with, with, say, genetic information, I don't know if the concern so much is that you don't want your private genetic information to be available. It's that uh, you're legitimately afraid that companies are going to find ways to use that to, for example, deny you insurance or charge you more, or your opponents may find out about it and start spreading genetic stories about you on Facebook, whatever. So I think that the, the challenge with privacy is actually a lot deeper than we think it is, because I think what we need to do 
is untangle what we mean by privacy and try to figure out what we can protect and we can't protect. So that's one set of issues. Uh, and I think, I think that there's a lot of, of playing, to the, playing to the gallery in a lot of our current privacy structures. Because I think the people putting those together really do understand that there's no such thing as privacy, but they also understand that a lot of people want to think there is. So that's one set of political structural issues. The second set is simply that um, it's an unfortunate fact, I think, of conflict in the 21st century that whoever's AI gets the most data is the most fit AI and is going to win out over time. So we can indeed significantly restrict private data in the European Union and the United States. And I think the only real impact of that would be to assure that the Chinese AI becomes dominant. Now, that may be good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not reflexively anti-China. I think there's a lot of value in Confucian ethics. But most Americans tend to value American ethics over Confucian ethics. Next question. So um, one of the things that you know, U.S. government agencies have had trouble with is actually um, having a productive dialogue with the tech companies. Um, I guess, you know, have you had any thoughts about how you know, we can become more like partners rather than you know, being on the different sides of the privacy issue or any related? Well, I think part of it is that there's some of the tech companies are going through a difficult cultural evolution. Um, if I were a large tech company, I would have to be thinking about what it means to become an equal player to nation states in a post Westphalian world. I think that a lot of times, particularly depending on the branch of government that's approaching the tech companies, we tend to assume that it's clear that they're only companies and we're the state. And I'm not sure they're operating under that assumption. Now, publicly they are. I mean, Facebook, you'll notice, set up what they called a Supreme Court on, on uh, global speech and then rapidly pulled in their horns when the optics became pretty damaging. Um, but I think that Facebook really was trying to think of the right idea. I mean, they got a bunch of people now trying to figure out what freedom of speech means in the 21st century. That's not something that the Americans are willing to, to think about. You know, um, that said, I think that it is fairly clear to me that the core culture of multinational, international companies that have been spawned by the United States, including Facebook and Google, is aligned very much with the interests of the US government. I think that there is a reflexive anti-government, anti-military in a lot of the younger workers in the tech companies. Um, but I think probably the older and more responsible people in those companies understand that if they're going to have a place where they want to live and work, it's going to be something like the United States. How you, how you build on that, I think is very difficult. And I think part of it is both the tech companies and the United States government need to be much more open about the way that the geopolitical environment is shifted. Is that at all helpful? I mean, I, I, well, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting a, you know, a silver bullet to say, hey, this is how we become partners, but I just wanted to hear some thoughts. I collect them, so <laughs> um, it, it's something that my organization specifically deals with, and you know, we're, um, I'm Homeland Security, obviously, we're yep. in the news a lot, you know, we, we get shut down a lot, there are parts of us, um, but I'm from the science side, and I, I just feel like, you know, that's probably a, 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 a way to engage them if they're willing, but I, I think you got to find the right people first, 
Um, yeah. You know, I think there are scientific collaborations. I mean, we're both interested in, you know, um, taking like terrorism content, child exploitation content, you know, off those platforms. Those are some common goals that we have, but I think that every time that something happens and blows up in the news, it just kind of sets us back. So I'm very careful, you know, <laughs> treading, tre treading around them. Well, and I would, I would add to that, that if I were, um, if I were Russia, I would sure be trying to stir that pot. So I think, I think, I assume that, that at some level, people are looking at the way that some of our adversaries are trying to encourage the schism between, between public and private interests and security in the United States. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also see if you can grow people in homeland security that are, that are able to, to talk and make compelling the areas of common interest. Because I think, I think one of the things to break down is the fact that there are a lot of preconceptions in private companies about uh, Homeland Security and about the military. And those preconceptions tend to be naive and they tend to, be, they tend to reflect the academic environment, which tends to be anti-security, uh, anti-military. Um, so if you emphasize the positive things, you know, we worked with Google on this technology and it helped us reduce uh, child pornography, for example. Knowing that at least some of the tools you're working on are dual use, right? So that developing competency in areas that are, um, that, uh, that demonstrate added value for both parties in a very nonpartisan way becomes a way of learning to develop technologies together that might be useful, particularly in a crisis. Uh, that's what I want to do. I'm just, you know, I don't think yeah. they want to do that yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I figured. <laughs> I, um, Please go ahead. Uh, so I have a follow-on uh, question to that. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how much um, these companies, you said, you know, they may be, um, you know, out, they may be the inheritors of the Enlightenment, right? So, but there's been a lot of talk about regulating them, right? So um, I was curious to hear what some of your thoughts are on, you um, regulation because what's happening now is a lot of them, they're picking and choosing, right? They're picking and choosing, yes, I'll let you use my platform for this, but not for that. Yep. Well, I mean, so, so at, there's a number of, of answers to that, um, some of which are mutually exclusive, but that doesn't mean you can't believe all of them. Um, there's an obvious need for a counterbalancing power for some of the big uh, global firms. Um, interestingly, enough, interestingly enough, you can argue that China has figured out one way to regulate their big firms. They've, they've established the principle that in part you exist to help us accomplish the goals of the state and the party. That's a form of regulation that it seems to me is light enough that it it doesn't impede the development of the firms, but it's also pretty clear exactly what your responsibilities are. That works in the Chinese context. It clearly doesn't work in the American context. I think the problem with American regulation is that because of the adversarial system and because of a fundamental belief in checks and balances, we've developed processes that are very um, uh, process intensive and take a long time. And the result of that, I think, is that our regulatory structure inevitably falls further and further behind the reality of what's going on um, in the companies and in the global uh, marketplace and in the geopolitical marketplace. And I think, at, and this works in a lot of ways, right? I mean, is Facebook trying to develop a regulatory regime in the United States that creates barriers to entry? Well, you know, I don't know. Um, if that's a side benefit of regulation, I'm sure Facebook wouldn't turn it down. The, 
The question of how to regulate something like Facebook, though, presupposes a regulative capacity that can understand the world that Facebook's operating in and their technologies and their challenges. And to be frank, I think the regulators have been left in the dust. I think that's part of the problem we have now, that we need to move towards some kind of more sophisticated regulatory paradigm, but we really haven't worked hard on trying to figure out what that might look like. I mean, the European Union, for example, is, is using antitrust and, and data regulation uh, in ways which are not unfamiliar uh, in an effort to try to manage the behavior of firms. The, the question of whether there's a more effective way, I think, is one that clearly needs exploring, um, but we really haven't seen a lot of it. Uh, and one more final question, Braden. No. <laughs> it's not really a question, it's more your thought on something. I've taught computer science and cybersecurity at the high school level for, for many years. And when you were talking about the paradigms that are out there that change in society, I think the definition of privacy is evolving. I can tell you in the generation of the students that I teach, their definition and understanding of what privacy is, is very different from my generation um, of what their definition of privacy is. And I think that that's going to be driving the dialogue in future. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the more we develop the capability to get into people's brains and express what they are thinking, um, uh, which I think is going to be more difficult than some of the people working on it think, but it's clearly in process. I think the more we're going to have to change completely our idea of what it means to be a person. Um, right now, right now we tend to operate at three levels, right? We tend, to, we tend to have our public persona, we tend to have a private persona that sometimes dances on tables without appropriate clothing, and then we've got what's in our brain, and we never talk about that because we'd all go to jail. Um, and I think that as we begin to develop the ability to get into that second level, cultural mores and definitions are going to change. And I think one of the problems of the privacy area is exactly what you said. The older people, the ones doing the policies and the regulations, have one idea of privacy. The companies and the younger people have a very different definition. They both call it privacy, but it's very different. Um, and let me close with, with an observation. Um, you know, bless you for, for teaching what you did, um, because there should be a lot more of it. One of the things that I find interesting is, as far as I've been able to tell, there is not an engineering school in the country that trains anybody but a subset of their computer engineers on security and privacy. And yet we tell these people to go out and build these huge networks um, using the Internet of Things and sensors and everything else to create these brilliant pieces of infrastructure. What we're essentially doing is training our engineering students to go out there and build vulnerabilities into our society. It's crazy, but it shows again, to your point, the fact that, that the definitions, the challenges, the way we think about things has shifted profoundly over this last 15 years and our institutions have failed utterly to keep up with it. Thank you. Thanks uh, for everyone's attention on that keynote speech. And Braden, especially to you, uh, mind-blowing. I'm sure the question time could go for another hour, seriously. Uh, well, but we'll, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody wants to send me any emails or criticisms, um, please feel free. Thank you We're so much, Braden. ASU.edu. Can you repeat that, Braden? Yeah, it's Brad, B-R-A-D, dot... Allenby, A-L-L-E-N-B-Y, at ASU.edu. And again, you could find Brad's details uh, on the webpage uh, that you registered at, uh, katinamichael.com slash uh, SINS19, Social Implications of National Security. And Brandon, I'll make sure to follow uh, and reply to the whole group with uh, the speaker's emails. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate it. And thank, thank you for uh, having me, folks. Thank you.
So now everyone, we're uh, running a few minutes over time. Uh, but I wanted to actually, the first thing I wanted to do was to get people to introduce themselves one to one. Um, this space is a little bit closed, but I think we could do it in the first row. And what I'd like before we all grab a cup of coffee is if half of us stand on this side and half of us stand on the other <laughs> side. Literally, we're going one speed at a time. Dating. Yeah, it is speed dating because otherwise we won't get to meet. I, I can guarantee you it'll be five o'clock and nobody will know everyone in the room. Um, say what you wish to say, uh, but it's just a quick introduction and you never know how you might be able to tie back to the individual. You might start here. Um, so maybe the second row can just get up and Ivan, you come over this way. You see Rio? Yes. Uh, and and uh, I can't see it. You want to turn here? Yes, this way. So you're sorry for the chairs being in between us, but there'll be a second row here. Yeah, so we face each other. Sorry, sorry about the chairs in the middle. Um, but you might want to go downwards. Uh, and just please feel free to introduce yourself to the person in front of you. Oh, so, so not to everybody, just to. One at yep. a time? Yep, one at a time, yes. Hi,